So it is really just a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Walt Larimore again. <laughs> uh, people who are familiar with ICMDA webinars will, I'm sure, have heard him before. And the, the issue here is that Christians often consider missionaries to be those who depart for another region or country to share the gospel. However, scripture teaches us that we're to be flavor, flavorful salt and attractive light every day where God actually has us now. And the biblical principles for everyday missionaries are surprisingly simple and fruitful, what the Lord might call an easy yoke indeed. In fact, Jesus, the Lord himself, is already doing everything necessary to make your daily participation in his everyday missionary uh, work stunningly effective. And so Walt, Walt uh, Laramore, MD, is a family physician. He's the co-author of CMDA's uh, The Saline Solution, which inspired greatly and provided the basis for the saline process run by IHS Global, which has been used by ICMDA and other organizations uh, as members of the International Saline Partnership all over the world. But, but uh, Walt and Bill Peel is where it all started a long, long time ago. Walt's also helped to develop CMDA US's Grace Prescriptions and was the inspiration for their new series, Faith Prescriptions. He's been recognized in International Health Professionals of the Year and International Health Scientists of the Year, as well as the 2000 Intellectuals of the 21st century. I'm not sure what number you were, Walt, well, in the 2000s, <laughs> but uh, congratulations <laughs> for being included in that. And we're really just thrilled to have you back here again and really looking forward to what you have to say. So over to you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's good to be had, I guess we could say. I imagine I was number 2000 in that in that list. But I, I come to you from the heart of the Rocky Mountains in the United States. We're in the middle of a blizzard here and the middle of a polar vertex. So I'm I'm bundled up, but my prayer is that the communion of fellowship that we all have over thousands of miles and the leading and the precepts of God's spirit and God's word will warm us all today uh, deeply in our hearts. And so uh, let me just pray as we begin. So Father, my, my prayer is that it would be you who would teach today, uh, not me, that uh, my words and thoughts would be obscured by the leading of your Holy Spirit. Uh, we're grateful uh, to be your friend and to be your ch children. We ask you to join us joyfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So becoming an everyday missionary, I think Peter set it up nicely just in saying that that so many uh, young healthcare professionals that I run into think being a missionary is going somewhere. And, and scripture is very clear that God calls us to, to be missionaries wherever we are. Um, I think of, of uh, an old preacher that I heard who once said, uh, to, of every Christian, you are either a mission field or you are a missionary. That's your, your daily choice. And being a missionary is just the relationships that we have with every non-believer that God brings into our path. I'm going to credit uh, Pastor Greg Finke um, uh, with his book, Joining Jesus and His Mission, How to Be an Everyday Missionary. Uh, it's available in English and in Spanish. And so if you chose to delve a little bit deeper into these precepts, that's a, an excellent resource for doing so. But becoming an everyday missionary is based upon the principle that you do not have to learn anything. There's no techniques. There's no memorization. There's no training. There's no special degrees or going to seminary. It's just simply being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, allowing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, God's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control to overflow. It's, it's not overwork. It's literally overflow. Jesus is already doing everything necessary to, to instill and encourage our participation in his mission and to make it simple. And, and all we have to do to be his everyday missionary is just every day when we wake up intentionally, uh, do what I do. When I, when I woke up this morning, it was very early. Uh, my first breath out is, is a prayer to the Lord. What are you up to in my life 
today? What are you up to in the life of those that you bring into my life today? Those divine appointments. God, you're sovereign. You're in control. There's nothing that will happen today that's a surprise to you. So that intentionally looking uh, forward to today and what he's going to bring into our day, and, and then asking him, how would you have me join you? You're already at work of calling people to yourself. You're already at the work, uh, in the work of convicting the world of sin, unrighteousness, and judgment. So how do I just join you? This isn't my work, it's your work. And how can um, I join you uh, in, in speaking into the life of those uh, that you bring today right where you've planted me, not in three years or five years or after my training or when I retire, you know, but right now, today. So there's six practices I'm going to review very, very quickly, or perhaps I would say six precepts to being an everyday missionary. One is each day to hear from Jesus. Two, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Three, have conversations with non-believers that, that allow you to be salt and do good to non-believers and for non-believers, to be light, to minister with prayer for and with non-believers every day. And don't do this alone. So quickly, let's run through these. And, and no need to take notes. Everything I tell you is going to be available in a handout uh, that you can access. Uh, we'll give you instructions at the end uh, today how you can get that. But hearing from Jesus, step one, it's just the practice of hearing uh, from him. Uh, it's just spending daily time with him in his word. But also, hearing from Jesus demands two additional elements that are described on a plaque in a, a retreat center that I go to that says, be silent and listen. And those of you uh, who are listening in English know that uh, can see that the the word silent and the word listen are made up of the same exact letters, and I think that's not a coincidence. Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes tells there's a time to be silent, and if we follow the example of our Lord, that's every single morning. James says everyone should be quick to listen. Mark says, God the Father said, this is my son. Listen to him. <laughs> I mean, God the Father is telling us, listen to Jesus on a, on a daily basis. And, and Proverbs says, listen for God's voice in everything you do, in everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. And, and I like to begin the day, uh, I, I have a little mantra that I begin the day with. I sing the Lord's Prayer. It's an old Anglican tradition. And then I have what I call the prayer of Samuel, which is just speak for your servant is listening. To begin that day as I as I dawn the day, saying, Father, I'm not only listening, but I'm looking for what you're going to do in me and through me today. Number two, step number two, seek first the kingdom of God. This is the practice uh, of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's simply, it's being on the lookout. It's expecting God to show up uh, every day. I, I call it a seeking pearls in the muck. The, the idea that in the, the, the muck of each day, the, the mud that we have to slog through, the difficulties of each day— that God has planted in, in our day pearls that we can discover if we're on the lookout for him and, and, his, uh, and his work that he's already established. Uh, in the Beatitudes, Jesus tells us to seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Chronicles, First Chronicles says, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek him always. And in Amos, this is what the Lord says, seek me. And Psalms tell us, this is what we would say, you, God, are who I earnestly seek. I seek you. So seek first the kingdom of God. Now, steps three and four are simply being salt and light. It, it's words and work. Combined, not one without the other, but the two combined. And and I, I like to think of salt as speaking the good news for others to taste. 
Um, it, it's it's communication. It's both speaking and it's listening. It's it's conversation. Sometimes in healthcare, it's very short conversations, but it's conversation that's missional. I, I in the sailing process, we talk about the fact that in in sowing and and in cultivation, uh, conversion is not the key. It's conversation. <laughs> conversation occurs before conversion. Uh, people don't trust Christ until they first trust a Christian and hear from him or her and see him or her. So salt is speaking the good news. Light is living the good news for others to taste. And it involves competence. It involves doing excellent work for others, doing good work for others. If you're in school, it's it involves becoming the very best student you can. In the healthcare profession, it involves being the very best healthcare professional that you can be. God demands competence, excellence to do everything we do as unto him. It also involves our character, demonstrating integrity and an honesty. And in many areas around the world, just demonstrating integrity and honesty is a bright light of, of witness. And then there's compassion, simply displaying kindness and service to everyone we meet every day, no matter how busy, no matter how harried our schedule is, that we slow down just a bit, that our character and compassion, that our light will shine through. Salt that is not too salty, light that's not too bright. Salt that's flavorful, light that's winsome are attractive. So it's speaking the good news and living the good news. And my model for that is Jesus himself. Just to give a couple of examples, in Matthew, Jesus went proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing. He didn't do one or the other. He did both. And when he sends us out as his disciples, he gives us that same charge. In Luke, it says he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And I suspect most of you listening today are skilled, are becoming skilled in healing the sick. But we also have upon us the commission to proclaim the kingdom of God, to be salt and light as we do that to be flavorful salt with words. You've seen the, the in the Beatitudes, you're salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and, tamp and trampled a, underfoot. So, so no doubt we can be unsalty, but also we can be too salty. I, I was having uh, lunch with my son one day and and he he ordered a sandwich and he picked up the salt shaker and he he went to just put a little salt on his on his sandwich, and somebody had loosened the top. And when he tilted the salt shaker, the entire salt shaker emptied out on his on his on his sandwich, and it completely ruined the sandwich. So it's salt that's flavorful, tasty, not not salty, not too salty. So let your conversation, Colossians says, Paul teaches in Colossians, let your conversation be sometimes full of grace. No, 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 no. Be never full of grace. No, 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 no. Scripture says, let your conversation, in this case with unbelievers, be always full of grace, seasoned or sprinkled with salt. Salt is a great seasoning, but it's a terrible fertilizer. And so sprinkling your conversation each day with salt. And being attractive light uh, your works should be attractive. You, Jesus says you're, you're the light of the world. Uh, 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 you know, a, a town on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light for everyone to see. And in the same way, my brothers and sisters, we're to let our light shine before others that, that they may see our good deeds. Not just hear our good words, but see our good deeds and glorify God <clears throat> who is in heaven. So step three of being an everyday missionary is having conversations. So it's the practice of intentionally seeking relationship by having conversation with the pre-believers that he brings into your life. 
2 Corinthians, Paul teaches that God has committed to us the message of, reconcil of reconciliation. <clears throat> We're therefore Christ's ambassadors. For some reason, God has chosen to make his appeal through us. I'm not sure it's the plan I would have chosen for him, but it's the plan that he has chosen for us. Salt, speaking good news for others, communication, conversation that is missional. But what kind of spiritual conversations are you having with your patients, with colleagues, with, with your neighbors uh, that God brings into your life each day? And one of the tests of that, if you are not having spiritual conversations, your patients, colleagues, neighbors will not be asking spiritual questions. And Paul tells us very clearly, be prepared always to make a defense for the faith that lies within us when asked, yet with gentleness and reverence. And if you're wondering, <clears throat> what are some practical ways I might do that? Dr. Saunders had mentioned ICMDA's sailing process, our CMDA's grace prescriptions, and there's multiple modules for ways that you can consider being flavorful salt in your daily interactions with pre-believers, whether it's faith flags or faith stories, whether it's faith prescriptions, or whether it's your personal testimony, your hope, your hope story. So being salt, the son of man came eating and drinking. And, and my favorite name of Jesus, of all his wonderful names, is that he was called a friend of tax collectors, a friend of sinners. And wisdom proved that that was the right type of witness for him. And so as God brings pre-believers into your life through your day, do you consider using meals? I mean, most of us eat three meals a day. That's about, it's over a thousand meals a, a, a year. If you just do two meals a day, well, it's well over 500 meals a day. And just in the book of Luke alone, there are 10 wonderful stories of Jesus dining with people and 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 meals and meals coffee breaks tea breaks can become a wonderful time to interact with people to be salt and to be and to be light and so in the handout i've got references for all 10 examples of, of dining with people of all sorts of people that you might want to consider and having spiritual conversations in in the sailing process we talk about a spiritual assessment about the God questions. And you can ask these questions of most anybody you meet when you're asking people, where are you from? And what do you do? And what type of job do you have? And do you have a family? And these God questions will often fit. They allow you to see where is someone in their spiritual journey? You're not trying to push anything. You're just finding out who they are and where they are. And so those of you that have been through the sailing process know that the God question, yeah, can I ask about your faith background? Do you have a, a spiritual or faith preference? I'm not here to push mine. I'm just, where are you on your spiritual journey? Is God or spirituality or religion, prayer, something that's important to you or, or not? The O questions, well, if, if faith is important to you, are you part of a a religious community or a spiritual community? Uh, if so, how often do you meet? How important is this community to you? And the D of, of the God questions in English, the God question D, is just thinking, well, what can I do? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be salt and light, so is there a step I can help you with? Can I help you grow in, in your spiritual life? Do you need any spiritual support? Do you need any prayer? Can I pray with you? Can I pray for you? Can I have others pray for you? It's not something you do with every person every day, but as the Holy Spirit leads, having spiritual conversations. Step four, being an everyday missionary, is doing good work for, for people. It's it's uh, the, 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 the being excellent in what you do. It's the practice of meeting needs in the name of and empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's walking through the day in the power of the Holy Spirit, but leaving the results up to Him. It's by being light, making the kingdom and grace of God a, a little more visible, a little more recognizable to people that He brings into your life every day. Mother Teresa says, not all of us can do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. And Dr. Seuss, that famous theologian, said, to the world you may be one person, but to one person today, today, you may 
be the world. Remembering that light, living the good news, is our competence, our character, our compassion. And Paul teaches in Ephesians, Ephesians, for it's grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's not by works that you can boast. So works in no way save us. Our, our faith saves us. But once saved, once called into the kingdom, once adopted by the Father, once his child, we are commissioned to do good works. In fact, Paul says, for we are God's handiwork. We're created in Christ to do good works. And these aren't just things we think of. These are works that God prepared for us to do before time existed. He waits to join you as he calls you into his work, into the lives he's calling. Scripture tells us what in James, what good is it if someone claims to have faith and has no deeds? You foolish person. Don't you know that the evidence that faith without deeds is useless? A person considered righteous by what we do and not faith alone. So faith without deeds is dead. Jesus Christ, Titus, we read in Titus, gave himself to us to redeem all wickedness and to purify himself, purify for himself a people that are his very own. That's you and me, eager to do what is good, what is right. And I know, brothers and sisters, most of you are already doing this, knowing that one day, will all appear before the judgment of Christ, receiving a reward for what we've done while in the body. Works don't save us, but they're proof of our salvation. Uh, and we'll be and we'll judge for them, whether good or bad. So my question for you, brothers and sisters, not only what is God doing in you, but what is he doing through you each and every day? And then finally, our second to last step is ministering with prayer. And let me be very clear about this. The practice of prayer is not saying a, a, a perfect prayer with the perfect words. It's simply inviting our King to come into the needs, troubles, the distress, the disease, the problems of those we interact with on a daily basis. Often, uh, when I offer to pray with a neighbor or a colleague or a friend or a or a patient, I, I may say something like, "Would it be okay if I, I I prayed about this for you?" And and it's I've had three experiences in over forty years of practice where patients have have turned down prayer, which is fine. I I offer it, and if they say no, that's fine. Um, but uh, all I find that most people expect that I'll pray for them later, <laughs> but if I say, would it be okay if I pray for you about this? And if they say yes, I say, well, let's let's just pray right now. And I invite my king to join me as a healthcare professional and to join my patient or to join, join me as a friend to, to enter into my friend or my neighbor's troubles and to bring us together his wisdom. What's God's will for you, my brothers and sisters? It's clear in Scripture. We are to rejoice always. We are to pray without ceasing. It's to be spiritual breathing throughout the day. We can't survive without spiritual breathing. We're pray without ceasing. And we're to give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because these three practices are the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. In Timothy, Paul says, first of all, first of all, I urge that supplications, prayer, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all. And Philippians, he says, brothers and sisters, there's, the world's on fire, but do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, in every appointment, in every interaction, in every prayer and, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the result? The fruit of the Spirit, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ, in Christ Jesus. John Bunyan says, you can, do, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray before you've prayed. 
And I love the old theologian Samuel Chadwick, who says, Satan dreads nothing more but prayer. His, his, his one successful plan is to keep the saints from praying. He, he doesn't fear you know, <laughs> prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our work. He mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles, brothers and sisters. He trembles when we pray. Don't be a prayerless Christian. Daily, with each person you meet, approach the throne of grace with confidence so that you can receive mercy and find grace to help you in the time of need, when you're seeing your patients, when you're visiting with friends or colleagues or other students. Why? Because brothers and sisters, as a follower of Jesus, indwelled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, you are coated with, covered with, clothed with the righteousness of Christ and the prayer of you. Brothers and sisters, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Don't go through the day without that cloak upon you. And finally, my last encouragement for you, my last precept from the Word of God is don't go solo. The practice of not going solo is the practice of ministering as part of a faith community with other everyday missionaries. Everyday missionaries don't go it alone. You can't do this alone. You're not designed to. You're not called to. You're not commissioned to. You're designed to be part of the body of Christ. You are not the whole body of Christ. You're just a part of the body of Christ, but you are a critical, crucial part of the body of Christ. So how, how can you build a small community where you are of everyday missionaries. Well, let me just suggest one that I've taught for well over 25 years now. It's been used in countries around the world by young men and women who I've had the privilege of, of training as they've become healthcare missionaries. And it's called the Andrew Project. Um, it's most recently been taught in the Truth Project, which has gone around the world. And, and let me just give you, uh, this is just one way of considering building a small team of everyday missionaries. So team up with one or more other believers where you work, in your neighborhood, in your church. It doesn't have to be a large group, just a small group. What if you don't know someone? Well, begin to pray that God will bring these folks into your life. And agree together just to form an everyday missionary team for some period of time. It might be a few weeks. It might be a few months. But just together, agree to, we're going to learn how to do this together. We're going to practice this together. Uh, and we're going to see what God does in us and through us. Be accountable to pray for each other daily, to, to touch base by by text or, or social media or email, or at least weekly, and, and to meet together either in person or, or electronically at least monthly. And, and as you go through this process together, share with each other what's God, what God's doing. What are you learning? Where did you goof up? What would you do different? What lessons are, are you making? If it's worth doing right, if it's worth doing righteously, it's worth making some blunders. God can teach us this way. And then each member of the group begin praying for five non-believers, whether they be colleagues or clients or family members or friends, but five non-believers that you have contact with fairly, fairly frequently. And each day, Pray for those five people. Pray that God will open their heart, that they would be receptive. Pray that God will open doors that you can share with them, that there would be opportunity. And then pray that God would open your mouth to share, that you would be salt that was flavorful, that you would have courage to be salt and light. And then consider each month intentionally providing something of substance to the person you're praying for, maybe a gift, maybe a letter, maybe a book, maybe a handwritten note, maybe a phone contact, maybe an, an email. 
for every person that you're praying for. And then at least once a, once, once a month, look for an opportunity to share your faith story, your personal testimony, your hope story with each of those five people. And then at the end of that period, meet one last time with your, your everyday missionary community, your missional community. Share the fruit that God has raised in you and through you as you've labored to be salt and light as an everyday missionary. So just a quick review, practices for everyday missionaries, hear from Jesus every morning. Seek first the kingdom of God as you go through every day. Look to have missional conversations, to be salt with non-believers. Do good to and for non-believers. Be light that's attractive. Minister with prayer for them, uh, for and with them, and don't go solo. So to conclude, Jesus is already doing everything necessary for us to participate in his mission. Just we need to ask, Father, what are you up to in my life? What are you up to in the life of those you bring into my life today? Give me the questions that I can ask to find out where they are on their journey. And how would you have me join you in your work with those you bring into my life where you have planted me today? Our greatest need in this world is just for Christians to follow Jesus fully. And if we do, our words and our lives will be a model in each of our cultures, a model that each of our cultures needs to hear and see. Salt that is flavorful and tasty, light that is winsome in the dark, and leads to the light of the world. If following Jesus is important at all, he is all important. If Jesus is anything at all, then he is everything. He is either the most vital thing in your life or he isn't worth bothering with. And so my question for you, my challenge for you, don't be professing Christ without possessing him. Don't overwork to share him but allow him to overflow in you and out of you. The supply of heaven is adequate for the demands of our spiritually starved world. The question is, will we offer that supply to the hungry that God brings into our lives each and every day? Who's that one person today or the two people that God is bringing into your life today into which you can be salt and light? into which you can be an everyday missionary. And as such, may the revival that the world needs start with you, start today. Why not you? Why not now? Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of your spirit and your word and your people. May you combine those crucial elements into each of our lives. May you, Father, glorify yourself in us and through us. May we become your everyday missionaries with those that you call into our life, that you bring into our life. Most of us can fare, confess some uncertainty about doing this. But I pray that my brothers and sisters would step out in faith, in truth, and in love to be flavorful salt, win some light to those you bring to each of us today. So, Father, for what you're going to do in us and through us, we give you glory. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen to all that. Thank you very much, Walt. We've been listening to Walt Larimore on becoming an everyday missionary in medicine. And we've now got some time for question and answers. The first one, and, and you uh, really hinted at this in your prayer about the uncertainty that many of us feel about, about this, despite everything that you've said to encourage us. And there's a question here. What openings would you recommend for healthcare professionals interacting first with patients and then secondly with fellow staff 
where the laws of the land or the hospital organization prohibit what they would consider is proselytizing or simply sharing one's faith. And of course, people listening to this broadcast come from all kinds of different political and, and ethnic uh, contexts as well. But uh, how would you respond to that? Yeah, uh, great question, uh, Peter. Uh, I, I wanna emphasize there's, there's no technique. Uh, there's nothing to memorize. Uh, this is simply loving people where they are at, meeting them where they're at. There's no law against that. There's no precept against that. There's no jail time for, for that. Uh, people have a, a God-shaped emptiness in their life. And at some point, God is going to begin to knock on their door. Uh, it, it, Jesus tells us that he'll knock and that those that invite him in, he will come in and dine with them. And so loving and serving people in, in the name of Christ is something that we all can do every day and can do naturally. But if we are salt that is flavorful and light that is attractive, it will generate interest. It will generate questions. And it's always legal to answer people's questions. Now, answer them wisely. In fact, I, I mentioned uh, where Paul says, be prepared always to make a defense for the faith that lies within you when asked. And then he gives two caveats in that scripture. He says, uh, uh, to do it gently and with reverence. So gently, the, the, the Greek word that's translated gently there is a root word for breastfeeding, for feeding a, 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 an infant. It's a, it's a very uh, intimate, it's a very gentle process of, of feeding a, a newborn. And also reverence, it, it, it refers to if someone asks about my faith, that I, I'm approaching the holy of holies. This is a holy moment. And so if no one's asking you about your faith, then my question for you is, are you being salt that's recognizable? Are you being light that's recognizable? And if not, then to consider some of these precepts, some of these principles, uh, and we do that in the saline process of, of using faith flags, faith stories, even faith prescriptions when appropriate and with permission uh, with our patient. So this may not be something that you do every day. It may, it certainly won't be something with, I mean, you'll do good work with every patient, but salt may vary from patient to patient, but it's going into that, in this case, the, the clinical situation, intentionally looking for God is already at work and simply blowing wind on the, on the, the, the spark that the spirit has. I, 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 I love the, the model that, that, you can't light a match. You can't light a fire on wet firewood. You know that that God's spirit already has to be at work. At work, and so some of those spiritual assessment questions become very easy ways to find out where my my patient is, where my colleague is, where my friend is spiritually, and whether they have any interest in spirituality or not. So, Peter, a, a very few quick uh, considerations to a very important question. No, thanks very much. Now, right at the beginning, Walt, you mentioned uh, you gave a book recommendation quite quickly, and we will, we'll, when we write to people afterwards, we'll send information on that. But a couple of people have just asked about specific book recommendations that you might have. You mentioned the Saline Solution course, of, of course, but anything else apart from that? Yeah, well, the first, the, the one that really <clears throat> opened my mind to this idea quite a long time ago was a fellow named Greg Finke, that's spelled F-I-N-K-E, uh, a former pastor, now has a ministry called Dwelling, uh, two four, I think it's 214, Dwelling 214, um, in, in reference to that verse that, that Jesus uh, dwelt among us, he tabernacled with us, he, he lived with us. And so his book is called Joining Jesus on His Mission, How to Be a, an Everyday Missionary. Um, mm -hmm. And then the Andrew Project comes out of the Truth Project that originated here uh, in the United States. Of course, the saline process uh, that we have at ICDMA uh, is an excellent source for learning how to do this. And then the, you mentioned earlier, Peter, the new 
of faith prescription modules that were produced by uh, CMDA in the U.S. I think they're up now to close to 30 15-minute modules that are very accessible and allow small groups uh, to talk about uh, how to take a spiritual assessment, how to be salt and light um, with patients, how to share faith flags and faith stories. And so all of those resources are available uh, through us here at ICMDA. Great. Well, and we'll give people a reference to those too. Uh, Reverend Daniel is asking, these principles work only for healthcare professionals or can they be used uh, every day by all believers? I, I think that's probably a, a no brainer, but what? what? <laughs> well, Dan, is it Daniel who's doing our Russian interpretation and I would say, da, da, da. <laughs> uh, no, the, everything that's in the saline process, everything that's in grace prescriptions and the faith prescriptions are just biblical principles with a, a healthcare professional coat put on them. So, Daniel, absolutely, everything that we've talked about here is being an is how to be an everyday missionary wherever God plants you. Um, it may be on the seat of a plane or a bus or a train. Uh, it may be in a lunchroom. It may be in a library. It may be uh, in a park where, where you have what would seem to be a coincidental, just brief interaction. But to go into that brief interaction, asking the question, God, what are you doing here, if, if anything? And how can I join you? That intentionality um, of knowing that, I, I, I think of it this way, fellowship and worship are interactions that I can only have with other believers, with other followers of Jesus. Evangelism or mission are the can, can be the interactions that I have with non-believers. Every interaction that I have with a non-believer becomes an evangelistic opportunity. And I'm not talking about necessarily sharing the gospel or, or pushing someone to pray a prayer. It's loving them and meeting them where they're at. Here in America, there's research showing that the average adult convert will name between nine and 24 significant people that touched their journey to Christ. Well, as a healthcare professional, we don't have to be all 24. We only have to be one. We can approach our patients, our friends, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can leave their salvation. We can leave their results to God. He's in charge. This is his process. This is his work. We join him, and we do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. We leave the results to him in all of the relationships that we have each day. Yeah, absolutely. And that takes a lot of pressure off us, doesn't it? Uh, well, know. you know, it does, Peter. In fact, I think uh, we started teaching these principles internationally. Gosh, it must have been in the mid-90s. And the yeah. two most, most common feedbacks that we got from participants was, one, well, I can do that. <laughs> That's yeah. just being me, that's just loving people. That's just being a good healthcare professional. That's looking, anybody can do that. I don't have to have a ministry of divinity, a PhD in theology. I don't have to pass an evangelism course. I don't have to memorize. I just, be. it's easy. It, this is easy. I can do that. And the second thing you, you pointed out is people say, wow, I don't feel guilty. Uh, you know, I like to think that guilt comes from our enemy from the, the, the person that hates us, who hates our soul, the liar who comes to kill and steal and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly. And so, brothers and sisters, if you're feeling his conviction, well, that's from him. But if it's guilt, it's from our enemy. And, and, the, and, and any process that's biblical will fill us with joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Thanks, Walden. I just love the way that you've emphasized all the way through the sovereignty of God, that this is his work, that we're joining him in it, that it's not about overwork, but overflow. And of course, uh, what follows from that is, is just how key prayer is. So you started with prayer, you ended with prayer because it's God who opens doors, who gives opportunities, who gives us the courage to speak, who gives us the words to say, 
who opens people's hearts to hear and understand. So it's really just uh, a matter of being involved with him. Uh, do, do you want to say anything? And, and, and you talked so so much too about being sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in these situations. You know, if a door's not open, you don't have to crash your way through it. You wait for, for God to do it. Just So just any other lessons you've learned uh, along those lines in terms of walking with the Spirit in this whole process? Yeah, I, I would urge my brothers and sisters to not separate your spiritual life from your secular life, to not to not separate who you are in Jesus from who you are as a healthcare professional, but to merge those two together. And is it a bit scary and unnerving uh, to, to begin to be salt and light? Well, it is. But I remember as a young physician doing my first spinal tap. I remember uh, doing my first... Uh, uh, urinary catheterization. I remember uh, starting my first IV and my first blood draw. It, it's it's scary to start start doing something new, but if it's worth doing, it's worth doing. And these things that we learn as healthcare professionals are life saving. And so, beginning the process with a small community of other like minded believers, of beginning to be an everyday missionary and learning that together. And is it a little bit scary and unnerving? Absolutely. But it's not just life-saving. It's eternity and life-giving. And so blessings on the journey to each of you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks for emphasizing, too, that that fear, anxiety is, is normal, that it's a learning process, that we make mistakes along the way. That doesn't matter but uh, God will gradually teach us. Now, you mentioned a number of the of the uh, skills that are taught in Saline Solution, and just wonder if we could come back to a few of those. Can you just explain to people who perhaps not heard, what a, what is a faith flag? Yeah. That's some well, kind of American can... thing, is it, where you put a, a flag out the front of your property, or what, what's a faith flag? Yeah, well, it, kind of, it, it, it came to me many, many years ago, uh, I'm a, a student of history, and I love the stories of the armadas uh, when the when the naval armadas sailed the world, and and uh, and even today, uh, boats will fly flags that tell you uh, who their sovereign is, what what country they're flagged to, uh, who they're serving. Uh, in the old armada days, the flags uh, told observers. Uh, not only who you were serving, who you were sailing for, but where you were going and what you were carrying, whether you were a military ship or a commercial ship, for example. Uh, my wife and I were at a port here in the United States, and we noticed the fishing boats coming in and out. Then they would fly the, a flag saying what fish they had, as they were coming back into port, what fish they had caught and how many they had caught. So I had this idea that can we, in our conversation through the day, have little faith flags uh, of things that will indicate to, to our patients or to our colleagues that spirituality or spiritual things are something that are meaningful to us, that that are open to, to us. Uh, it could be a, a simple little statement about, well, you know, God bless you. Uh, or I'll be, if it's okay, I'll be praying for you as you as you go through this decision-making process. Or, or, or maybe a, a faith story, you know. Uh, I, you, I, I understand you're wrestling with this decision about parenting your child. I'll make that up. And, I, and so I remember when Barb and I were, were raising Kate and Scott, uh, parenting was really difficult. And I'm so glad for the principles that we learned from the Bible as, as we raised them. It's just a little, little faith flag. Uh, they're, they're not memorized. They, they just come out of overflow as you're mm -hmm. trying to indicate to a patient or colleague or friend that spirituality, religion, relationship with Christ, Jesus is something that's important to you. You just kind of pitch it out there. You you don't look for, expect a response, but you see a response. And it's yeah. real easy for our Christian patients and friends to pick up on that real quickly. Um, and then our non our non Christian uh, patients will hear that and listen, and they'll know that this is a safe area if they want to discuss it in the future or even that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much. Now, you talked about personal testimony as well, and uh, perhaps can you illustrate that for us? Uh, how would you share a personal testimony and when 
would you do it within a consultation? And you know, how yeah. long, what kind of content do you vary it on the person? Do you have a any tips about that? Yeah, I, well, it, any intervention that we that we offer patients should be with permission, with respect, with sensitivity, and when indicated. So I don't share a testimony with everybody or, uh, at all. But it'll often come as a faith story or as a hope story. And for me, it may it may begin this way. You know, I remember when I was younger wrestling with with something like this, whatever it it might be. And and then a very brief story of of what it was like not knowing Jesus, briefly how I met him and what life has been like since he came into my life. In other words, whatever the need is that I and my patient or I and my colleague or I and my friend share, I'm just sharing my story of how Jesus or faith or the Bible or biblical precepts helped meet that need for me. So it's, it's I call it my hope story or my anchor story or my, my faith story. Um, Gosh, Peter, if I had to guess in, in patient care, it might happen one or two or three times uh, a month. It's it's not an everyday thing because what interventions do we do that we do every day with every patient? It's very few, but it's in our spiritual black bag. And that's what the sailing process at ICMDA is all about. We have spiritual tools that we can become skilled in using. We don't use every tool every day with every patient, just like the tools that are in our, our our healthcare professional black bag. We don't use every tool every day, but we have those available to us so that prayerfully and intentionally we can use them when indicated with permission, sensitivity, and respect. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, just to come back to the question of opposition again, we started, didn't we, with with uh, talking about difficult contacts. And someone shared a story in the questions there anonymously about uh, their wife being in hospital, having someone opposite who'd attempted suicide, was in distress, and she sought to comfort her and offered to read the Bible. And, and a nurse reacted, and a Roman Catholic patient in the next bed reacted, and 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 so on. It was very difficult. And and of course, you know, this is a spiritual battle, and we will face opposition, and there will be difficult conversations and settings. What what would you have advised someone in that situation? A apart from, I'm sure to say, don't give don't give up. Yeah. <laughs> this happens yeah. sometimes, but but keep persevering. What what would you say? I think there's a couple of different things that happen in those situations. One is. Uh, is persecution, is active opposition. And and Jesus not only said that that will happen, he said, expect that to happen. He mm -hmm. says, they hated me. They will hate you. He was called mm -hmm. to suffer. He calls us to suffer. Uh, so if we're willing to be salt and light, then we will be willing to accept persecution. But yes. I tell my students, there's no need to accept unnecessary perse persecution. <laughs> and so to be sure that as I'm salt and light, that I'm doing it in love with permission, respect, and sensitivity. Now, part of that is, it, is if you are in a situation where you are keeping medical records, that you keep notes of, of what you do, even if it's a personal journal, but if it's an actual medical record, to be sure to record if you pray with someone or uh, that, that you record that in the note with the fact that you were asked to pray with them, mm -hmm. uh, that you had permission to pray with them, that this was in response to a patient need, not to something I was pushing uh, on a patient. In fact, I've spoken at hospitals where I've actually taught the secular non-Christian healthcare professionals how to respond when a patient asks them for prayer. Uh, yeah. uh, because that that happens in in the healthcare healthcare situation. So to to be able to record what you've done, you're not hiding it. You're just meeting a patient's need that they request, answering a question that they have with love. But if there's persecution, being prepared to accept that joyfully. 
Uh, yeah. Because uh, Jesus says that the reward that we will have for that persecution is great in, in the Beatitudes. And so for those of us that have the opportunity to walk suffering and to walk persecution with and for our Lord mm -hmm. is going to result in great, great re reward. Not that we look for it, but that we know that it will come as we become salt and light. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, a great note to to end on, I think. So it just uh, remains for me to say thanks again, Walt, for your for your time, for your example and encouragement, particularly today, and to all of you for coming along today to take part in ICMDA webinars. May the Lord bless you. Look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you.